with that, let me hand it over to Mohammed. Okay, thank you. It's like a shot. <laughs> Symbolical. <laughs> okay, let's make a toast <laughs> to uh, Professor Vinod Minan, uh, who's uh, visiting from New York. Uh, so he's a professor at the physics department, also chair of the physics department. So yeah, thank you very much for making time to come. Uh, it's always a heavy duty to be a chair of a physics department. So uh, Vinod has done a lot of interesting creative works experiments in particular in the light matter interaction i've been very fascinated with this work and uh, i hope we hear some exciting uh, uh, results from his, his lab and what he's uh, planning to do also in the future um, there might be some slots left to, to talk to him in the afternoon uh, but if you're interested just come come to me and we, we can arrange it but most of the slots are, are taken because he's going back tonight back to New York. So thank you again for the thank visit. You. Should I give the symbolical shot back to him or? <laughs> yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. And can I just... Uh, yeah, it puts on like a regular microphone. Like Great. Thank you, Mohammed, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for having me here. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's actually my first uh, in-person seminar at the university since March of 2020. So. Thank you for uh, giving me this chance. Um, so I'm from City College of New York and uh, City University, uh, which is under the City University umbrella. And uh, at the very outset, the agencies that have made possible all this work, um, Army Research Office, NSF, um, and um, DOE, DARPA, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And we're also part of a CREST Center, which is an NSF funded center, which um, is for graduate education. And so today I'm going to talk about um, light matter interaction in Van der Waals materials. Um, most of the work I'll talk about today will be on these uh, transition metal dichalcogenide systems. Um, but at the very end, I will, given the interest at Maryland um, in light matter interaction and correlated materials, I will also bring up um, one specific example of a correlated material where we're going to look at uh, some uh, light matter coupling. So um, uh, some quick introduction to those who are not familiar with transition metal dichalcogenides. These materials became popular um, in the um, uh, 20, around 2010 um, when it was discovered that if you go from a bulk system to a monolayer, you form a direct band gap as shown here. And these are materials like um, where you have a, met, a metal atom like molybdenum or tungsten, and then you have the sulfur, selenium, or tellurium occupying the, um, which are shown in the orange or yellow. And uh, they're not one atom layer thick, they're actually three atoms layer thick, uh, but if you look from the top, they still form the hexagonal lattice. Um, what, because these become direct band gap in the monolayer limit, um, you can see that you will get a very large enhancement in photoluminescence when you go into the monolayer limit. So uh, pretty well-known concept. Uh, they also have a very large uh, oscillator strength, which is a good measure of how strongly it interacts with light. And uh, the oscillator strength of, um, so if, for example, at two EV in these moly disulfide, you get absorption over 10%. So just to put the number in context, uh, with silicon, which is the most widely used uh, photovoltaic material, um, you need about 50 times the thickness of one of these materials to get the same amount of absorption. So, and these large oscillator strengths come up, comes about because of the d orbitals that are involved in these uh, transitions. Um, the other aspect of these materials is the binding energy. So if you take a typical 3D material, um, and if you look at their, um, the an electron hole pair, these field lines get screened by all the other um, uh, carriers inside the system. Whereas if you take a, if you reduce the dimensionality and bring it down to the monolayer limit, you will see that the, uh, the screening is significantly reduced outside the layers, and hence you have a very large binding energy between the electron and the hole in this monolayer limit. And this essentially results in a large separation between the exciton and where the quasi-particle band gap starts. So, um, and now um, these excitons are, can still be framed within the Vanier picture. So they do have a bore radius. They are extended over a few lattice sites. Uh, in fact, the bore radius of the 1s exciton, which is the one that mostly is studied, is about 1.5 nanometers. Um, 
because the binding energy is so large, one can actually see the excited states of these systems. So along the lines of what one would um, talk about in a hydrogen atom, not exactly the same model, but um, you would you can see these excited states of the exciton. So this is the um, uh, the one s exciton, the two s, three s, and then finally you get the continuum. And so you can see all these excited states, which makes them quite attractive, especially from the standpoint of light matter interaction. And we'll see one of those examples as we go along. Yes. Is there anything to be uh, mentioned about the width of these creatures? So um, yes. So uh, so the as you can see here, as you go to the higher states, they become broader. And it's because these things actually uh, have a very low oscillator strength and they don't live that long. So they have a very short lifetime. So that's one, and they're much more susceptible to disorder as compared to the 1S state, which is much more localized. So they might be a group of Lindbergh like states. There could be, yes. Uh, yes. And in fact, we use the idea that they are more delocalized than the 1S to introduce interactions between them through the cavity. I'll, I will get, yeah, so along the lines of what you're just asking. Yep. No, no, um, they are, no, the different S's are not coupled. The, so this is the, the, these are the energy levels of the uh, system. So these are the different, you, you can have, um, so people have looked at some um, transitions between them uh, in other systems, but not in this. So here it's all just, I'm just looking at the, either the one, so the ground state to one S or the two S state. And is the S just a descriptive symbol there or does it correspond to a symmetry? It's like, yeah, so it's like the S and the P. So I can't directly excite the P state. There is a two, uh, there's an equivalent P states as well, but I can't do it directly. Uh, so I need to use a two photon excitation to do that. Uh, there's a lower state than 2s there'd be a 2p state that comes up as well between the 2s and the 3s there's a 2p state that comes up yeah so does that so, mean um, the state uh, excuse me this is bill phillips on zoom D does that mean that that this the um the state that you're exciting from that is the that um the the state from which you create the axiton yeah. has uh, a different parity than the than what the uh, the s exciton states have so it has odd parity is that right and and if so why i'm trying to understand why you can't excite p states but you can't excite s states it seems well, like you it can, could be a parity you can rule. excite the p states but you need to do a two photon excitation right. type process yeah right so that's just what you'd expect if there was yeah. a parity problem yes so so why is the parity of the state that you're coming from uh odd if, if that in, is indeed the case <laughs> just that the, it's a semiconductor so the balance semiconductor man don't have the same symmetry oh okay that's a question okay got it yeah does that answer you Bill? Yeah, I, I well, I, I didn't quite hear you because uh, the mic is far away from you. <laughs> the, 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 the valence and the conduction band don't have the same symmetry. Yeah. So when you excite from the valence to the conduction band, you already have a dipole moment. Yeah, I'm just, un, uh, what, what I'm not understanding is why is the valence band odd parity? <clears throat> Is it just that, that, that I, I, I probably I, uh, uh, I cannot say what one has to do like a band structure calculation, let's say Galley Marsonite or any other system. Yeah, you do the calculation, then you see what the what the symmetry of each band is. And then when you form an exciton, it's usually from like the valence band has one symmetry and the conduction band has another symmetry. Okay, so Galley Marsonite is actually P to S, yes, right? Exactly. Okay, it's, yeah, so, okay, good, thanks. These are the lowest, um, the the direct band gap that is formed, right at the K point. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so um, just quickly uh, moving on um, an introduction uh, and, uh, to the TMDs. So the excitons that we are studying are all lying in the plane. So you can see that from your Fourier imaging uh, technique where you see that the um, from the radiation pattern. Um, you can also, the nice thing about these materials is you can stack them up and you can create all sorts of um, interesting um, heterostructures. So just to quickly summarize what makes um, 2D transition metal dichalcogenides, a good material system to study strong light matter coupling. Well, the binding energy, the large oscillator strength that I mentioned, um, they also, because the um, direct band gap is formed at the K points, um, the K and K prime points in the balloon zone are not identical in terms of the optical selection rule. And so you can, by coming with a certain handedness, you can excite carriers in one valley or the other. And that's um, what is shown here um, in this valley polarization picture. You also have, um, because the binding energy is so large, you can even form things like trions, which are um, an additional electron or a hole coupled to the exciton itself. Um, I mentioned about the Rydberg states. And then finally, the nonlinear optical response of uh, these materials makes them uh, pretty interesting as well. And you can also use that as a way to look at the crystal symmetry. So um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about Rydberg exciton polaritons. There seems to be a lot of interest in Rydberg states here. Um, and um, so let's start with that. So I, a quick primer on strong light matter coupling and polaritons. So what, how do you generate polaritons? You take any kind of material excitation. It can be um, excitons. It can be phonons. It can be um, uh, charge oscillations. And then you bring a photonic system, either an optical or simplest being an optical resonator, you bring it into resonance with the mag, uh, material resonance. And if the coupling between the two are strong enough, you create these hybrid states that are called polaritons. And um, these hybrid states now have properties of both the material uh, properties as well as the photon properties, which makes them pretty interesting. So here's how you uh, um, create it. Um, you have your, um, in this case, an exciton that is sitting between two mirrors. Um, and they have an interaction between the exciton and the photon given by the small g. Um, gamma exciton is the um, decay rate of my um, exciton. Gamma c is the decay rate of the photons out of the cavity. And so the requirement for strong coupling is that the g, the interaction strength between the exciton and the cavity photon has to be greater than the decay rates of the two systems. So if you have this kind of a picture, then and then you write your Hamiltonian as a sum of the cavity Hamiltonian exciton plus the interaction term. And so the interaction term is what is shown here, uh, which is your creation of an exciton, decay of a photon, creation of a photon, decay of an exciton. Um, so here is um, how the, um, I'm gonna just go through all of them. And so you can see here, this is your cavity term, which has got a parabolic dispersion. This here is your, the second term here is your, um, uh, the exciton term, which is within the wave vectors that we are interested in, it's a flat dispersion. And then once you get into the strong coupling regime, you get these new eigenstates, which are the upper and lower polaritons. Um, did I lose my mouse? Okay, no way. So I get these um, uh, lower and upper polaritons and they have these eigenstates that are given by this, um, uh, uh, by these um, these two um, sets of equations where x and c correspond to what is called the Hopfield coefficient or what is the fraction of my photon or exciton in each of these branches. So if you look at this lower polariton branch, it starts out very uh, exciton-like and then it becomes very photon-like. And the upper polariton is exactly the opposite. Um, so, uh, in the case of Van der Waals materials, they host a whole kind a set of polaritons. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'll focus only on exciton polaritons, but they also host phonon polaritons and plasmons and plasmon polaritons and so on. So again, um, this is how uh, these things were, uh, these polaritons were made, uh, are usually made um, or realized in the lab. You have an excitonic system, a quantum well, sitting between two Bragg mirrors. Um, and then you get the coupling between the exciton and the cavity photon, giving rise to these um, new eigenstates. And the nice thing about them is by just looking at the angle at which the light comes out, uh, you can directly map the in-plane momentum of the system. So if you can do a dispersion um, and, just, and then doing a spectral 
um, if you look at the spectrum of the system, then you directly map the um, uh, the polariton dispersion. So the nice thing about them is that the electronic component gives you the interactions um, and the scattering and nonlinearity and so on, whereas the photonic component gives you the spatial coherence and long propagation length. Of course, they were um, uh, the initial interest in these systems was because um, from a condense, uh, can we realize things similar to both Einstein condensates in these systems? Because um, your requirement is goes as the lambda d Broglie's proportional to one over mass kBt, and this mass is extremely small here. It's 10 to the minus four to minus five that of the electron. So you can get condensation at more elevated temperatures, and that was a big motivation here. Um, I must. Uh, and so this was the idea. So you can create these lower polaritons, you drive them, and then you create a macroscopic coherent state that gets created at the bottom. Um, I want to bring the caveat that these are not true BECs because the polariton number is not conserved. Um, it's a constantly, it's a driven dissipative system. The polaritons are constantly leaking out of the system. And so um, you, you, but nevertheless, these condensates show properties like superfluidity and vortex, anti-vortex formations and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of work in this field. Um, we have recently been doing work with uh, organic molecules. Um, this is a room temperature condensate uh, that's been realized uh, with um, uh, dye molecules inside a cavity. And so you can see this clear threshold behavior um, seen here. And then you can see in momentum space, a highly localized emission that comes out. So all the scattering happening to k equal to zero about threshold. And then if you look at the spatial coherence, you see below threshold is just a blob that is emitting. But if you go above threshold, you can see the clear interference pattern indicating the coherent emission from the system. So this is at 300 Kelvin. And uh, the reason you're able to do this is because these are done with Frankel excitons, which have got a really large binding energy in the... Uh, so um, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, we are doing this work mostly as uh, to do some simulation like Hamiltonian simulators, where we are creating puddles of these condensates and then trying to make them talk to each other and things like that. But what I'm going to talk about today is mostly with PMD exciton polaritons. Um, again, this is the original work from Weiss book um, where they showed this strong coupling. Um, and just a quick summary of where this field is. Um, started with gallium arsenide systems. There has been a whole set of material systems that have been used to realize microcavity polaritons. Um, as far as phenomena goes, you're starting from condensation to all the way to most recently uh, using them as simulators and some topological polaritons and so on. So with that, um, what have we done? So back in 2014, when we started working with these 2D materials, the first experiment we did was to just see if we can actually strongly couple to these excitons in these systems. So this was um, this work here where we just put the 2D material between two mirrors, and then we can see the anti-crossing that happens um, because of strong coupling. We also then went on to show that these things actually preserve the valley properties. Um, this was uh, some work done in the group of uh, Daniel San Vito and uh, uh, Stefan Kenna Cohen, where we, they sh we showed that the polaritons can actually propagate long distances. And even if there is disorder in the system, it's not that bad. And finally, uh, this work here th at the bottom, where we were able to show that we can electrically drive uh, polaritons. So this is an electrically driven system where um, we are just injecting carriers into the system and then it recombines in the TMD layer and it strongly couples to the um, polariton system. So um, now let's look at why do we want to study Rydberg exciton polariton. So um, the concept of polariton blockade, where essentially you create one excitation, you create a one polariton state. But if the polariton polariton interaction is large enough, then the, when you excite, put in a second photon, the energy required to create a second polariton state, you have to pay a penalty. And that penalty comes from the nonlinear interaction between the uh, polariton. And this essentially means that the second photon will not get absorbed. So this is the idea behind the polariton blockade or uh, in this analogous thing in what is called the Rydberg blockade. So the idea is that once you can create this kind of a scena uh, scenario, the light that comes out has to show some kind of correlation. In other words, if I do a G2 measurement, I should be able to see some anti-bunching or some dip in the correlation. And the first evidence of this was in 2019, these two papers that came out, where they show, showed that the G2 value went for, to about 0.95 or something. So the first indicator that there is some correlation in the photons that are coming out of the system. So um, 
if you talk about polariton polariton interaction um, just um, and if you just look at the polariton dispersion diagrams so that's your cavity and the lower and upper polariton that i just mentioned you have two kinds of interactions one is the blue shift that comes about because of the exciton exciton interaction which essentially renormalizes my uh, exciton energy which means all the branches move up now, if I'm sitting at the lower polariton uh, region, it looks like that shift that I was talking about in the previous slide in the uh, case of the Rydberg, um, in the case of the polariton blockade. And so the idea is that I should get one line with shift for getting a second polariton in. That would be the ultimate quantum limit. But, and then the um, second scenario that can happen is that you can also have a phase space filling where the effective oscillator strength of your system gets reduced because there are no more excitons uh, there is no availability of another exciton to get created in that system. And in this case, what would happen is that your Rabi splitting would decrease. And you would get, um, so these two phenomena happen simultaneously. In the case of gallium arsenide, most of the interest was in these uh, in this blue shift. But um, it turns out that in the TMDs, because of the larger binding energy, these are, um, this phase space filling effect also starts dominating. So um, back in 2018, there was a uh, nice Excuse me, Bernard, could I ask yes. a, a, a question? This is Bill Phillips again. Yes. So I'm uh, uh, thinking about the um, uh, the anti-bunching yes. uh, that's due to this um, uh, Rydberg blockade or Polariton yes. blockade. Yep. It, it seems, it, but what, what you what, what you told us was that there was a little bit of a dip, like a, you know, that it went to 0. 0.95. Yes. Uh, so what I'm wondering is that even in a single particle case, yes, you expect some anti-bunching just because of the fact that it takes a while before uh, the system gets excited again. So you can see anti-bunching even in a single atom case. So can you really tell that um, this is due to an interaction effect and not due to something simpler? Uh, good question. So um, they are doing the experiments in the ensemble limit. So it's not a single polariton experiment that they're doing. Sure, but 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 your question is if I'm just uh, going to be able to excite a single polariton, wouldn't I see this? Right. <laughs> if it is a, um, if I excite a single polariton, would I see it? Um, um, I think Bill's question is if I uh, if I create um, well, like. But Bill, if I, you're talking about a second polariton, to create the second two polaritons, are we talking about a single, you're not talking about a single atom here. You're, talk, you're thinking about a single exciton coupling to a cavity photon. Am I correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the very first um, uh, demonstration of non-classical light, if I'm remembering correctly, had to do with just looking at the fluorescence from uh, single atoms. Now, you have to get to the single atom limit in order to see that. So maybe the fact that that you've got lots of of uh, of, of excitons um, uh, implies that it couldn't be this uh, single uh, exactly. effect. Uh, but you know, since the effect is small, it just makes me wonder whether uh, whether there's a possible contribution from a, uh, a single polariton effect rather than a polariton polariton interaction. Yes, so now I get the question. So um, I, I do not think in the system that they have studied, you could get, um, you could get pol polariton formation with just one exciton. I mean, or rather the Rabi splitting that you would get will be so small. Yes, um, so what they're still seeing is in the ensemble limit. Uh, okay, I see. So, yeah. so part of the story here is yes. that you get a big interaction because not just because you've got uh, a lot of photons, because you've got a lot of atoms. So you're getting this uh, square root of n uh, exactly. uh, piece. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, in 2018, there was this nice paper from Thomas Paul and uh, his uh, graduate student, Valentin, that showed that if I can push this to a larger quantum numbers, then I could get a larger nonlinearity. So 
you know, we went back to this idea of uh, Rydberg states and TMDs and asked ourselves, can we do a simple experiment that shows the scaling of the interaction with the uh, Bohr radius or going to the larger quantum number? So this is the simple picture that your interaction is proportional to Bohr radius squared. Uh, but you should remember that it's not that straightforward because your Rabi splitting also changes with the higher ends that you go. So anyway, um, we went ahead and our goal was just to show this concept that we went to just 2S versus 1S and we wanted to compare the um, interaction strengths. So we, this was work done by my then graduate student Jay um, and a whole set of other collaborators uh, listed here. Um, and we take this distributed Bragg reflector, three layers of this TMDs um, and then cap it with a silver mirror. So it's not even a high Q uh, cavity. And you can see here that as I change the temperature, I go from, so this dotted line here is where my 2S state sits. And then as I decrease the temperature, I move it into the cavity. I get my Rabi splitting and it's about 9 milli electron volt. Um, so it's smaller than what we typically get with the 1S state. The 1S state is about 30 MeV that we get. And, uh, but the important thing that we wanted to understand was how does the inter, uh, interaction of these excited state polaritons scale between 2S and 1S. So what we look at is we pump the system resonantly and then we watch the two branches as a function of the pump power. And you can see here that as I change my intensity, my Rabi splitting starts going down. Um, and then uh, of course, if I go to very large pump powers, there's no more Rabi splitting here. But if I stay within the strong coupling limit, as I mentioned earlier, both the branches can move both up or they can move towards each other depending on the contribution of the two effects. And what we see here is that um, the, so what we have done here is we have plotted the normalized Rabi splitting. And that's because like I mentioned, the Rabi splitting for the 1S is 30 MeV, Rabi splitting for the 2S is 9 MeV. So to make a fair comparison, we need to normalize it to the absolute Rabi splitting. So the, what we're really looking at is the relative Rabi change in Rabi splitting as a function of density. And what you see here is that for the 2S state, I need, almost an order of magnitude lesser number of um, uh, polaritons to be created to be able to shift um, in these Rabi splitting by the same magnitude. So um, we are nowhere close to the um, quantum limit. Uh, this We are talking about at this interaction strength, we are talking about about 150 to 200 polaritons needed to shift by one line width. So very much still in the classical limit. And, um, are there ways to go beyond this? Uh, well, you can go to 3S possibly, but again, the low oscillator strength is a problem. So one needs to come up with more creative ideas to, if you want to follow the Rydberg direct angle uh, towards pushing it to the quantum limit. So um, with uh, having seen this problem and the fact that we don't have a cryostat that goes below four Kelvin, um, so we can't go do anything more than 3S uh, at this point, we thought, are there other systems that we can, or lessons that we can take from the cold atom community. And there, the idea of dipolar uh, polaritons have been around. And so this is the idea behind the dipolar polariton. So what we're really doing is we're going to use the idea that if you can have polaritons where there is dipole-dipole interaction, then they will actually uh, have a higher interaction strength. So the idea in Gallimard's night that was introduced was I have an indirect exciton formed between two quantum mills and a direct exciton formed just in the quantum mill. And now in this case, uh, what happens is if I look at, uh, if I can create a hybrid state between the direct exciton and the indirect exciton, then I get this Coulomb interaction between the electrons that are involved in the system. So I, that is the idea. And then your interaction strengths become really large. So, um, and so the trick is to hybridize the interlayer and intralayer excitons. So it's been done by the group of Atachi Mamangalu and Ronan Rappaport on Gallimard's night systems where they've seen some increase in the in overall interaction strength. So we wanted to ask if there is a similar system that can be realized in, um, in uh, 2D materials. And so here is the uh, idea. So it turns out that naturally occurring bilayer molybdenum disulfide. So if you do your exfoliation badly and you get a bilayer uh, instead of a monolayer, that naturally hosts uh, interlayer exciton that gets formed. And the interlayer exciton is shown here where the hole is distributed between the two layers and the electron is sitting in one of the layers. Now, the only issue is that there are two of these. One that gets formed, so this is layer one, layer two. 
So there is one that gets formed between the K, K prime and the other one that forms between the um, K prime K, if you want to think about it that way. And only when you apply a voltage, can you lift the degeneracy of this interlayer exciton and they move in the two directions. One towards the A exciton, the other one moves towards the B exciton. But if you just look at a spectrum, you will see that this is the A1 state, and then there is an interlayer state that gets formed. If I apply a voltage, I can lift this degeneracy and then they move apart. Yes. Well, this is the picture that is portrayed. It is a hole that is delocalized between the two layers. At least that's the. I understand that the, the balance band. Yes. Would hybridize. That's yeah. And if I occupy one of them. Exactly. I the occupied the other. Yeah, that's right. But why the conduction band does not hybridize? But intuitively, I would say the opposite should happen because my uh, spin orbit is stronger in my balance band. Yes. So the idea of this this picture is actually um, just presented in this paper, and actually there is an open debate about exactly how this is. It actually a tunneling process that is happening, or is it really a delocalization? That's it's not. Well, even if it's a tunnel, yeah. It's conduction, exactly. So, but so to answer your question, the exact nature of this exciton is not well uh, very clear. In momentum, it's indirect. It's momentum, it's indirect. Like, yeah, in momentum, it's an indirect one. Yeah. It does. You can see. You can see here. That's a one s, and this is. But the thing is, it, it seems to borrow some of its oscillator strength from the b exciton in this case. So that's what is helping in this case. Yeah. So, um, so it seems to have. Uh, and so, if I apply a voltage, I can have a permanent dipole moment in the system. And so we. Um, we went ahead and made a system where we had a bilayer uh, cavity. So this was work led by my postdoc Bishwajit and graduate student Mandeep. So this is at seven Kelvin. You can see the strong coupling where we get all sorts of branches here and I'll just go over what these are. Um, so it's actually the A exciton. I get the strong coupling to the A exciton. I get strong coupling to the interlayer exciton, the 2S and the B exciton, all with the same cavity, just because all of them are pretty close to each other. Um, so you can see that, uh, and so what we're most interested in is just the interlayer and the A exciton. And um, so we're going to look at what happens to them as I pump harder. So again, I'm doing the same experiment, resonant pump, looking at the two polariton branches and asking the question, what happens to the two branches as I put more uh, carriers in. And so you can see there are two things that can happen as I increase the density, as I mentioned, you can have saturation where the Rabi splitting becomes smaller. But you can also have the other effect, which is the um, exciton exciton interaction, which shift my um, uh, exciton resonance. So in this case, the Rabi angle actually changes. So that's the um, that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to try and identify what is the contribution from the exciton exciton interaction versus the phase space filling um, in this case. Um, so we um, go ahead and look at this, and we extract out the Hopf field coefficients. Um, and this is a theory calculation, um, sorry. And so now you can see here that I can extract out my shift of my exciton, um, of my lower polariton as a function of the Hopf field coefficient. And you can see that the sum of these two will be skewed to the left if both contributions happen. And if it was just the um, saturation effect, which is the one shown in red, then I should not have um, any um, it should be symmetric about this half field coefficient. It should be maximum at 0.5. The fact that it is shifted indicates that the exciton exciton interaction also uh, plays a role here. So um, we can see here that the interlayer exciton is 10 times more interactive than, or the interaction is more, is 10 times higher for the interlayer exciton than in the uh, uh, exciton that is formed in the monolayer, that is the 1s exciton. Um, and that the saturation effect is roughly two times of the exciton exciton interaction. So that's the estimates that we have made based on this um, picture. And you can see here that um, if I plot out my um, energy shifts, actually, I'm just going to go to the next slide. You can uh, compare the interlayer to the intralayer, and you will see that the, now the interaction strengths that we are getting is about 100 micro EV micrometer squared. We are now brought our number of polaritons required for one line with shift to about 100 polaritons. Again, it's still in the classical limit. 
Um, the other thing to point out here is that we have not applied a voltage and created true dipolar polaritons. It's still, there is no, so the net dipole moment doesn't, is not, it seems like it's not fully canceled, but it's in, in principle, there should not be a net dipole moment because there'll be as many ups as, as many downs in this case. Yes. Yes, exactly. So then uh, it should be one over R2 one over positive. Yes, exactly. So then can I just go back over a level of calculation and see whether these numbers actually make sense? Um, so this is the problem. Right now we have not applied voltage, right? So the number, so we don't have, a, so because the, uh, the, in, the interlayer that is formed in one, di, uh, in one particular value case is the exact opposite of the one in the other case. So we don't, we have not created permanent dipoles here. We're just working with just the interlayers that are degenerate. We need to apply a voltage, create the di permanent dipoles, and then look at it, and then it'll agree with what, it should agree with what you're saying. Perfect. This does not have a permanent dipole, exactly. But even without that, we are getting a, it seems like by optical excitation, we are creating some imbalance, and that's why we are seeing this larger effect than what we see with um, even the Rydberg states. Yes, you. Uh, so I have a basic question. So how shall we estimate the polarity density, especially for those excited? Uh, the, the next two okay, so we, um, the, I, I'll refer you to the supplementary on this archive paper, but um, uh, I, the way we look at it is we look at the dip, the amount of dip at a given state, and the number of photons we are putting in, the absorption, and then we solve um, self-consistently to get the uh, density in the system. Yeah. So that takes into account how we're relaxing. Yes, exactly, exactly. The line width and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a that's the tougher part of this whole thing to get estimate the polariton density. Yeah. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, great. So let me. Yeah, let me quickly go through strain, uh, some ideas that we have done now with strain. Um, so uh, this is some work that started during the pandemic because the labs in New York were shut down. My postdoc Florian went back to Germany and uh, worked with the group of Alexei Chernikov. And uh, something he had started in my group at that point was to look at how does strain influence exciton diffusion and can we use strain as a way to tailor the nonlinearities. So the idea is that they take a gallium arsenide quantum well and uh, sorry a nanowire and then they put the TMD on top of it. Um, this is tungsten diselenide encapsulated between boron nitride, and then you cool it down and you look at the spectrum and you see that as I scan over the nanowire, the all all the energies, the exciton, the trion, all of them get redshifted, indicating clearly that you're creating a potential minima around the strain location. So this is the estimate. Our estimate for strain is about 0.15%, and we're getting about 10 milli electron volt minima in my uh, potential. So um, the question was, uh, you know, what happens to my exciton um, at diffusion in this kind of a channel that I've created? Because remember, the strain is only along one direction, so uh, the exciton should only see the unstrained in one direction and strain in the other direction. And indeed, uh, if I look at the um, uh, the diffusion. You see that along the wire there is diffusion, uh, whereas perpendicular to the wire it's it stays the same. And I can give you guys details on how these measurements are done, uh, but it's essentially a spatially resolved, time resolved experiment, so you can actually look at the diffusion of these systems. And because the exciton itself lives doesn't live long enough, we look at these dark excitons which live longer, and hence we can study them more, better. So if you look at the diffusion, you'll see that perpendicular to the direction, uh, perpendicular to the wire, which is dy, there is barely any diffusion. And along the x direction, you, you get a large um, diffusion, which is, com which is actually comparable to what happens in a monolayer. So we have essentially suppressed the diffusion in one direction and allowed the excitons to only propagate along the wire. Um, and so now the question is, can we use this idea to somehow localize polaritons um, in these systems? So we've recently made a cavity so this is an atomic force microscope image of a monolayer TMD sitting on top of a, nano, a, a pillar versus a waveguide structure. And so this is the cross section, how it looks. And so we've designed it in such a way that the electric field maxima is only on top of the pillar and not anywhere else. So the strong coupling only happens where the strain is maximum. And uh, you can see here that uh, the strained versus unstrained, even at room temperature, 
you can see a shift because of the uh, strain location. So this is the photoluminescence map of the structure. And you can see again that only the strain regions light up because that's where my field is maximum. And everywhere else it's dark. Um, and you'll see here that um, as I increase the input pump power, the phase space filling effect seems to be more dominant for the strain uh, case. And we also see a larger blue shift of my polariton um, in this case. And again, indicating that, um, so we are not increasing the nonlinearity per exciton, but the number of excitons that I'm able to put within a given area is larger now because of the strain uh, induced potential minima. And that seems to cause this um, increased overall nonlinear response. So this is still work in progress. And, um, and I'm going to come to the last part of the talk where I want to talk. So, so far, everything I talked about was TMDs. So Rydberg excitons, and then move to dipolar uh, systems of the interlayer excitons. And then finally, the use of strain as a way to increase the overall nonlinearity. I'm going to change uh, topics here a little bit and go towards this other class of materials that have recently emerged, which are the Van der Waals magnets. So um, recently, um, in 2020, there was this paper that came out um, about um, coherent minibody excitons in Van der Waals antiferromagnet nickel phosphorus trisulfide. Um, this material, by the way, is not new. It's been studied for a long time. Uh, but these, uh, this group, uh, this paper reported it uh, at different layer, um, different layer thicknesses and so on. Um, and they also found the appearance of excitons. Um, again, um, the exact nature of the excitons is not well known in this system. There is still a lot of debate about how these excitons get formed. Um, and I'd be open to uh, hearing more about it from the theorists uh, in the audience. Um, and so, but you'll see here that you get these nice exciton emission peaks in photoluminescence. They also show up in absorption. And in fact, this peak is called, uh, they call it the uh, exciton peak. And this, this peak two that they see is attributed to an exciton magnon sideband inside the system. Um, these, um, the emission from the system is linearly polarized. These excitons disappear above the Neel temperature in the system, indicating that these excitons are related to the underlying magnetic um, order. And um, you will see here that if I look at the entire energy, this is the charge transfer gap. And then this is my DD transition. And this is where my exciton, this tiny blip that you see here in this big picture of absorption is what I'm showing here um, in, the, in this graph. So this is the, uh, so these are XY type um, systems um, and the excitons, um, the spins are aligned in this form. So the um, blue is the nickel atoms the purple are the phosphorus atoms and the sulfur atoms are shown in red. The, um, the exciton is believed to be, uh, and I say believed to be because it's not fully understood, to, to be an electron sitting at the nickel site and a hole sitting on the sulfur site. Uh, there have been a lot of experiments. So going back to 94, there's a paper from Roberto Merlin and coworkers where they show that the two magnons can be seen in the system around um, 400 inverse centimeter um, and more recently, um, some RICS experiments, um, resonant in elastic scattering experiment, X-ray scattering experiments, where they are able to see the one magnon and the two magnon peaks. And then more um, recently, there have been some experiments from the Nugetic group led by Baldini and others, where they were able to show that they can drive the exciton at that 1.55 peak, uh, which is that magnon sideband. And you can actually watch the coherent oscillations of the um, uh, magnons. So this, was, this is all indicative of the fact that the, uh, the excitons that are seen in the system have some, are tied to the underlying magnetic order. So what we did was the same uh, thing. We looked at our uh, system. We took NIPS3, shows really nice uh, exciton emission, 600 micro EV line width. Um, and you can see the three um, absorption features that I just showed you earlier in the paper. And uh, we en encapsulated it between uh, two mirrors. And you will see here that you can see nice strong coupling to um, all the exotonic features. So you can, uh, so these are the two exotonic features that we were discussing earlier. Um, and then this is that exciton magnon sideband. Um, and in fact, if you uh, increase the temperature, you will see that as I increase the temperature, this, um, uh, this features get lost because the excitons disappear above the Neel temperature. Sure. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, I, I think I went back, uh, I went to uh, in the feature that is observed. So this is, that's why I was pointing out that this is the paper and the nature of the exotons, whether it's actually a, 
it can't be a defect because I'm still seeing it in absorption unless there is so many defects in this material. Um, it is. It could be a bound exciton, an exciton bound to a defect state. We don't know that, and that's why I'm, I wanted to open this up. Yeah, yeah. So it is an electron. So we do see that it has all the features of an exciton. Like you know, you can saturate it by pumping it hard, like a binding energy and things like that. With the and the binding binding energy is pretty high already in this system. So the band gap is somewhere. Yes, the band gap is right there. The, the fact that it's below the band gap. Yes. And yeah, and and the binding energy that you get between the charge transfer gap and this where the exciton shows up roughly agrees with our saturation experiments where this thing eventually goes off. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So one version of this picture is that you are exciting an exciton and then one magnon and that's that 1.5 EV line that I'm seeing. That's one picture of it. The other picture is that it's it's another whole different exciton species that is dressed by a magnon, uh, by a underlying um, spin waves. And again, like I said, I don't know the answer which one it is. And that's why I'm, I wanted to bring this up today. Uh, we don't, and it's not clear what is the nature of the excitons in these systems. Um, also, if you look at the line, uh, if you look at the line width, you see how the line width of these excitons are pretty sharp, whereas this peak is much broader. And so clearly these are much more long lived coherent states, whereas these ones, this one seems to be a shorter lived system and it seems to be coupled to other degrees of freedom more. Yes. Could you repeat that question? The... Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. So the, the question is that, um, is the X3 peak um, that you're seeing here, um, is it really, uh, how do you relate it to a Magnon sideband? And um, my answer was that the X1 and X2 peaks are much narrower, whereas X3 is bro broader indicating that it has got some coupling. If it's a different exotonic species, it's coupled more to the uh, Magnon or some other degree of freedom, which allows it to decay faster than the X1 and X2 peaks. How does this line width uh, evolve with temperature? Uh, so you can see that in I this. Uh, how does the line width um, evolve with this uh, with temperature? Uh, or So you can see here, the line width does broaden up in this, as you can see here in this picture, the absorption lines. And this 150 Kelvin around there, that yellow is where the Neel temperature of the system is. Now you mentioned that the um, the exciton disappears when you go above the nail temperature. Yeah. I, I take it that the, the, the magnon sideband disappears as well. Yes, it does. Now, what I'm not understanding though is, it, it seems clear that anything having to do with a magnon would disappear above the nail temperature, but it's not, so clear to me why the exciton itself has to disappear above the nail temperature. Now you were saying that maybe it's the, the exciton is dressed by the magnon. So maybe that would explain it, but could, could you just say a little bit more about that? Yes. So um, the reason we think the exciton has uh, something to do with the underlying um, uh, magnetic order is because the light that is emitted by the exciton is linearly polarized and it is perpendicular to this, um, the spin chain direction. So um, depending on the domains of the spins in the system, you can actually look at the linear polarization and it's clearly maps that. And this linear polarization also goes away with temperature. Like if you go, go to uh, above the Neel temperature, it, I mean, above the Neel temperature, the exciton doesn't exist. But even as you increase the temperature, you can see that this linear polarization gets affected. Um, like I said, it, it's, there, are, there are competing views on what this exciton is. And uh, we, um, I mean, I, we don't fully understand what the nature of this exciton is. All we know is that as I increase the temperature, the excitons disappear. They have linear polarization, which is related to the um, orientation of the spin chain in the system. 
Okay, well, that makes makes a lot of sense that that both the disappearance of the exciton and its linear polarization uh, um, imply that it has something to do with the magnetic order. But what I'm not understanding is why does it have something to do with the magnetic order? I mean, I see the evidence that it does, but why should it? Yeah, so I think you're, you're, you're nailing the question as to what, how do excitons form in this material? And I think that's an open question right now. And this is precisely why I wanted to bring this up here today, because uh, you know, there are all these wonderful theorists around, and maybe there is an idea that will come out. Um, I, yeah, so I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a um, few other quick things about the excitons. Um, if I look at the luminescence, um, they don't seem to be very well coupled to the, um, so usually in a polariton system, I can excite them and they will um, relax via phonons to the lower polariton or via exciton-exciton interaction. Both of which seems to be absent at four Kelvin. If I go to 60 Kelvin, I at least see my polariton branch getting lit up, which indicates that um, the, there is a better scatter or phonon coupling is better in this case. Um, so that's um, so there seems to be phonon coupling if I go to a slightly elevated temperatures, but the exciton exciton interaction is pretty weak. And in fact, we can do this again with this same exercise that we did earlier, where we pump resonantly and watch what happens. And so now again, we do the same analysis, and you see that the exciton lines, no matter what densities I'm putting in, they barely move. So the blue shift that I was talking about, the renormalization, that doesn't seem to be happening in this case. And if it is happening, it's below our resolution limit. And if I look at the Rabi splitting as a function of density, that actually, um, you have to go to much larger densities, again, to see this uh, effect of the space space filling happening. So the only conclusion that we can come up with our exercise so far with, the strong, uh, with polaritons is that the excitons have a very small bore radius and they have a very large mass. At least that's the, and this seems to agree with some DFT calculations that have been done recently. Um, so again, this is something that uh, we, we're trying to understand the exact nature of the excitons in the system. We don't fully understand and I'm happy to take um, some any thoughts that you guys might have. This work was led by Florian and Resland um, who are postdocs and graduate students in my group. So with that, I just want to conclude what we have done so far, uh, showed the nature of Rydberg polaritons and interlayer polaritons, both from the standpoint of blockade type experiments that we hopefully can get to at some point. Um, strain engineering as a way to increase nonlinearity and uh, control diffusion of excitons, and maybe even create exciton lattices. Um, and finally, um, exciton photon coupling uh, in um, a correlated, um, insulator uh, nickel phosphorus uh, trisulfide. And this is something that's work in progress. We're trying to see if uh, by strong coupling to these systems, we can influence some other degrees of freedom. So with that, um, the guys who, uh, the folks who made all this work happen, um, my graduate students and postdocs, um, and I'll leave you with some of the relevant publications related to some of this work that I just talked about. And I'm happy to take any questions. Do you meet directly the in the inside the microcavity because normally normally you have a very uh, a very high dispersion in the cavity mode. So how do you do that if you have some kind of So what we do is um, can you repeat the question, yes. please? So the question is, how do I um, uh, do I just put the TMD straight between the two cavity mirrors, or is there some way to uh, tune the energy so that it um, it is in resonance? And the answer is we also all our cap most of our cavities are a bottom distributed Bragg reflector which is grown by sputtering or something, and then we encapsulate all our work. We encapsulate the TMD between boron nitride layers, and so then we know the thickness of their entire stack between the two boron nitride and the TMD, and once we have that, then we use PMMA as a capping layer to tune the thickness. And then we put the top mirror, which is silver, or we actually now have a technique where we can exfoliate another DBR on top of it. Yes, exactly, exactly, yep, yep. So that's the way we tune the thickness. And so we, we account for any, mis uh, uh, you know, to make it precise, we get the PMMA thickness to be correct. Uh, 
team is like a, like a key to leading to having these uh, exon flare cons. So the question is, if the reduced dimensionality in TMDs um, helps in creating exodon polaritons. You wouldn't expect to really get such nice results with like a bulk material, right? So the bulk was the uh, nickel phosphorus trisulfide one. The other, all other TMD work that I showed was monolayer or bilayer work. Okay. Do you think you would be able to, you also see um, you know, strong exotonic effects in like one Yes, absolutely. Oh, people have done, yeah. So there is work on carbon nanotube based strong coupling work as well. Yes, absolutely. People have seen exotons in carbon nanotubes coupled to cavities. There's a lot of nice work where they've aligned the nanotubes. Jun Kono at RISE has done some really nice work on this. Yeah. 